Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of Monster of the Week, the show where we dig up creatures from older editions of Dungeons and Dragons for use in your 5th edition game. I am your host, Josiah, also known as Dungeon Dad, and today we are going to be talking about another frozen creature for d and December. This creature does come to us from the 3rd edition book Frostburn, which you should be familiar with if you've been keeping up on the other d and December monsters. It is a twist on a classic d and favorite. I present to you today, The White Pudding. It is a distant cousin of the ever notorious black pudding and there is a surprisingly small amount of artwork on the internet for this creature. I mean I've covered creatures way weirder than this that have a bunch of concept art and that kind of thing that other artists have just done for that creature, but for this I could literally only find the artwork that is found in the book. So we're gonna have to get creative with some of the slides here, but if you are an artist and you like drawing things, there's definitely a niche out there for white puddings. Anyways, as always, we are gonna talk about what this creature can do in combat, some ways that we might mix it up and change it a little bit from what we find in the book, and of course, how you can use it in your home D&D game. So without further ado, let's talk about... Oh shit! Like most oozes, this one is in fact sticky, goopy, and amorphous. It's just as slow as pretty much any other ooze, however it does have a swim speed. I mean, it's still only 20 feet, but it can swim. That should scare you. Essentially this creature looks like just a mass of wet snow and slush. And that's how it gets you. They're notorious for just blending in with their environment as they're only found in climates where there is snow, so they can easily just creep up on unsuspecting creatures and drag them down. They're of course immune to acid, poison, and slashing damage like most other oozes. And of course its body is made of acid, so if you are not familiar with the oozes from the 5th edition monster manual, they give cumulative negative one penalties on any weapon that strikes them until the weapon gets to a negative five penalty, which causes it to just straight up dissolve. And if it's hitting you, your armor is gonna take a cumulative negative one penalty to armor class until its armor class bonus is equal to 10, at which point the armor dissolves. Of course, this only affects non-magical items, but it's worth mentioning just because some of you might not be aware of that classic lovely ooze trait, which we love them all for so dearly. These guys are also immune to cold damage, which should be kind of expected. And of course they have that nasty split ability. If you're not familiar with what that is, basically whenever you attack one of these guys with a slashing weapon, or you do lightning damage to them, they split in two. Now it can only do this if it's a large or bigger creature, so it splits into two medium creatures and it basically divides its hit points between those two new smaller oozes. Most adventuring parties and experienced D&D players will know about this in advance, but it's a lesson that every new D&D player has to learn and sometimes you just end up learning it the hard way. Now of course they can also move along all surfaces, including ceilings, which make them great ambushers. And they've got your standard array of attacks same with the black pudding, your pseudopod attack that deals bludgeoning and acid damage where they just reach out with a tendril and attack someone and they can try to grab you. That, unfortunately, is where the book ends. This creature, as per the Frostburn book, is essentially a black pudding that's been dipped in white paint and has immunity to cold damage. Now, as thematically interesting as that is for just kind of an alternate take on a monster if you happen to be playing a campaign in a snowy environment, I felt like we could do a little bit more. There just needs to be something else that differentiates this from the black pudding. So let's move on to... Now the first thing I did to make this creature a little bit different was change up its ability scores. Oozes are super stupid. They have almost no intelligence. It's usually one point of intelligence, one point of charisma, and maybe three or four points of wisdom, and that's it. They operate purely on instinct maybe it's a little bit smarter. And by smarter, I mean it has an intelligence of three instead of one or two. It still operates primarily on instinct, but it just adds this extra little bit of flavor that this creature kind of knows what it's doing. It's less of an animalistic creature that just wanders around wherever it happens to be, and a little bit more of a hunter. Maybe it actually is somewhat aware that it's blending in with its environment and uses that knowledge, or as much knowledge as it can really have, to try and ambush people. Now that might make it play a little bit differently, but there still needs to be one extra ability without pushing it too far because after all it is just an ooze. So I came up with this new ability called Frost Sickle, and I swear I was this close to calling it Ice Sickle, but that just doesn't roll off the tongue as well as I want it to, and I detest puns. As much as someone who plays D&D can detest puns anyways, because I mean, it's basically an unwritten rule that you have to make at least one pun at every D&D session at this point, right? 
Anyways, essentially what this ability is, is it makes a pseudopod attack, except it hardens that part of its body, as if it's freezing over, into a sharp edge and swipes at the legs of whatever creature it's attacking. If the attack hits, the creature who's being attacked then has to make an acrobatics check to try to stay on their feet. If they fail that acrobatics check, they are swiped and knocked prone, and of course they take the regular damage that you would expect from an attack like this, slashing and cold. Now, in 5th edition, being knocked prone isn't as big of a deal as it has been in the past, you can just use half of your movement speed to stand up. So, if this attack hits and you fail your save, your movement speed is cut in half. The logic behind this is it's essentially trying to cut the feet off of its prey so it can't escape and then the ooze can just take its time engulfing them essentially. Now while that might be a bit extreme to do to your players, if they fail their check, then they're maimed. I mean, their feet might still be attached, but they can't move. Their move speed is cut in half until they take a long rest. So maybe it cut through some of their tendons or whatever the case is, it hurt them enough that they're walking with a limp now. The classic strategy when dealing with an ooze, because they're so slow, is to just damage it and move away. Unless you're in a confined area that it can trap you, there's no real threat here, as long as you're aware of it anyways. Where these guys are ambushers and they're going to come out and cut your speed down, you have to really make use of whatever options you have at your disposal and think outside the box to escape this creature. Because now suddenly something that can only move 20 feet and wasn't a threat is most likely going to be able to move faster than you are. I just thought that this really mixed up this creature and gave it a defining characteristic that sets it apart from the other oozes and gives you something different. Plus, it sort of makes sense when you think of it as a smarter hunter that might have developed some tactics to try and deal with prey that was way faster than it. And if you happen to be playing in a game that's more brutal thematically, or where your players kind of expect a certain next level of cruelty when it comes to surviving, maybe if it knocks a player unconscious of this attack, it actually does cut their feet off. There's basically nothing in D&D that I can think of off the top of my head anyways that straight up just dismembers a part of your body. Because we have spells like True Restoration and stuff that specify they can regrow lost limbs. But I've maybe only ever seen that happen in a D&D game once or twice. Now I'm not suggesting you do that, but if it fits the narrative of the kind of game you play, it could be an interesting option anyways for the characters to have to now deal with this permanently maimed character, such as casting True Restoration on them. But that ultimately comes down to the kind of game you run and that's a whole separate video. So moving on to... If you're DMing any type of campaign that has a winter theme or a winter-like area that the players are going through, these monsters are excellent random encounters. They're good ambushers and they fit that theme really well. Because these guys have a swim speed, they also make excellent aquatic encounters. So for example, if you're DMing a naval-based game and the players are going through an icy or cold region on the sea, these guys kind of act like giant barnacles that might latch onto the side of the ship and then at night come up onto the deck and try to consume some of the characters. Or if you're using some kind of actual ship battling rules for other ships and sea monsters and that kind of stuff, maybe you have a giant white pudding, a proverbial ooseberg, if you will, and they have to fight it as some kind of giant monster. These frozen creatures also make excellent dungeon denizens, again, when thematically appropriate. If there's a dungeon that's in a cold region in your game, these guys are an easy replacement for the black pudding. Just be aware they're slightly more deadly so you can't just swap them in and out because the worst feeling in the world would be cutting the feet off of all of your fourth level characters. However, if it did cut the feet off of a bunch of characters, that could be a great excuse for you to have animated crawling claws on the dungeon. So there you go. Just made an encounter for you. A white pudding and a swarm of crawling claws that are actually all feet it has cut off of other creatures. Oh god, that's terrifying. But like many other oozes, it can work at a high level if you use it as sort of a trap creature. A pit trap to a level 10 character isn't really a big deal. A pit trap with a white pudding in the bottom of it to a level 10 character is terrifying. Because even if you survive that, your gear is going to get dissolved by all of the caustic acid and fluid that exists within any of the oozes, the white pudding not excluded. And on the slot train of using them as a trap, perhaps you've got a frost giant king who maybe has the classic like trap door in the center of his throne room and if he's speaking with someone who he doesn't like, pulls the lever and opens up and drops them into the rancor pit. Or in this case, a giant pit housing a large white pudding which the creature will then be consumed by. 
I find a lot of oozes work really well when just used as sort of a force of nature or an obstacle to just straight up be avoided than an actual creature. However, given our little intelligence boost we gave this guy earlier, they work great in the open as ambushers as well. Well, that is all I've got in this creature today, so hopefully you enjoyed listening to me talk about the most terrifying acidic version of figgy pudding you've ever seen, because I know I sure did enjoy talking about it, and if you like what I do here and you want to support the channel, please subscribe. If you're already subscribed, that's awesome. Thank you very much. Speaking of all that nonsense, in the description below you can find a link to all my social media stuff, so Reddit, Twitter, Facebook, all that goodness. And we've got a Discord server as well, so you can chat with myself, other members of the community. You know the drill. And it looks like this will most likely be the last video out on my channel in 2017. This was the year I started doing this and it has been a crazy wild ride and it's been just a lot of fun at every turn. So I wanna thank all of you guys for being on board the Dungeon Dad train in 2017. I wish every single one of you a happy new year and all the best in 2018 that's to come. Thank you so much for sticking by me and I will see you in the next year.